Uh, so we're going to move now into uh, end of day processing. And if we take a quick look at the different topics that we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to start off with at the, the point of sale side and the various end of day and shift operations uh, that'll happen uh, within the point of sale client at a given terminal or terminals. And um, so we'll, we'll start off with kind of the, very, the basics uh, around the various drawer operations that exist within the system. Uh, we'll talk about shifts, um, which I'm sure throughout the presentation I'm going to slip and call batch um, because we, we just recently renamed it to shift. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so if you hear me say batch, uh, I really mean shift. Um, and then we'll talk about some, uh, some new improvements that are in AX 2012 around floating till and blind close. And, uh, and we'll be able to do a, a, a demo for those as well. Um, so then once all of the end of day happens at the store, we'll talk about what, you know, kind of the end of day process, or not necessarily always end of day, but end of period, um, depending on the retailer and their needs. Um, but what basically what happens with all that information that's uploaded from the point of sale terminals uh, and when it gets into AX, uh, and that's through a statement posting process. Um, we'll look at the, the retail transactions that are uploaded. Um, and then we'll talk about doing statements um, two ways. You can do them manually, or you can do them utilizing the batch framework. And then finally, also, another core concept uptake that we had done in this release are the changes to how the financial dimensions work within AX 2012 versus uh, AX 2009, and some of, the, some of the modifications or enhancements that we've done uh, within the retail solution for that. So when we talk about drawer and shift operations, uh, I think this is a, a comprehensive list here. Um, if, I, if it's missing anything, it would be uh, something pretty minor. Um, but uh, I've broken it out into um, different operations that impact the, um, the drawer or the till, um, depending on, on the, the region you're from. Um, but basically, if you think about it as the, the money that goes into the, into the register. Um, so uh, typical functions that happen uh, for retailers, for those of you that aren't as familiar with retail, um, is that when a, a, you know, a cashier or, um, or the, the shift supervisor or the manager uh, begins the day or begins a shift um, at each register, uh, you need to declare the starting amount. So each, each, uh, each drawer will have a certain amount of, of money in it uh, to begin the day so that you can make change. Uh, and, a, and a pretty typical amount for that is around $100. Um, float entry and tender removal are, are basically ways to get money in and out of that drawer. Uh, so float entry is to put more money into the drawer. So let's say you started with $100 in your drawer, and then uh, maybe you need, a, you, know, uh, you need extra fives or extra tens or extra ones or something like that. So in some cases, you can just make change. You, know, you take out 20 and you put in 21s. Or in other cases, you just want to add money back into that drawer. And so float entry will allow you a way to, to do that. So it'll increase your starting amount or it'll increase the expected amount that's within the drawer. Uh, it also records a transaction for that so that those things are all audited. Tender removal is simply the opposite of that. Um, you're going to take money out of this drawer and perhaps go put it into another drawer. So you can do a tender removal out of, uh, out of Terminal 1 and do a float entry into Terminal 2, and you've effectively maybe moved a roll of quarters or something like that. And all of these things are treated as transactions, and all of these things are logged for auditing purposes. Uh, income and expense accounts, um, are, again, are ways to take... Uh, take money out of or put money into that drawer in ways that can be tracked. And differences around this is that you can set up different reasons for doing this and map these back to different GL accounts for when it hits financials. Um, so uh, a really typical example for expense accounts would be things like petty cash. Maybe you need to go buy a bottle of Windex and some paper towels so that you can clean the front window. You can take money out of the drawer. You can have a, an expense account set up for that, either called petty cash or cleaning supplies or something, and that can go into a specific GL account. Um, safe drop and bank drop. So again, um, very common um, occurrences within a retail store. Um, so safe drop typically happens when you want to limit the amount of cash that's within the drawer. You'll see this very, very commonly in convenience stores and in uh, gas stations and grocery uh, when high transaction volumes, lots of cash coming in, and for security reasons, you want to only have a certain amount of money within the drawer. So throughout the day, um, cashiers or shift supervisors or managers um, can do safe drops, and that takes money out of the drawer and goes and obviously puts it into a safe. 
Um, so it's still considered part of that shift because that money came in. It still needs to be accounted for, but it's no longer within the drawer. You put it somewhere else. Uh, bank drop is actually very much the same idea, only you're actually taking it to the bank rather than the safe. As far as the system's concerned, these, these two things actually do the exact same thing. We allow two different types so that you can track them separately and so that, again, they can go to different GL accounts if you need to do that. Um, finally, tender declaration. So at the end of the day, after you've done your starting amounts, you've either put money in or taken money out of your drawer for various reasons. Hopefully you've sold some things. Um, you also want to be able to, at the end of the day, declare how much is there at the end of your shift. Uh, and that's what a tender declaration is. In that case, you're counting what's in the drawer only, because we've already accounted for money that's gone out of the drawer, or maybe have gone into the safe or into the bank. So you're going to actually just count what's physically within that drawer, and that's your tender declaration. Um, so all of these different drawer operations are going to impact um, the amount of money that's, that's in the drawer or in the till. And then we measure that um, uh, within something called a shift. Um, so certainly this can be done by date time. And we have functionality within the system to do that, to just manage it by date time. Um, but what we find is that shifts don't always fit nicely within specific dates and times. So basically opening and closing a shift puts a marker on it. Uh, so if maybe you span a day, or somebody ends up working later than you expect, or the store stays open late for this period or something like that, being able to put markers on when, when the shift is end and have a nice bundle around these transactions that can be tied to a specific drawer uh, is very good um, for, for, uh, uh, for auditing, for accountability. And then when we talk about statement posting, it, it actually uh, resolves some of those issues there. So again, I just want to point out that the system has the ability to do it by date time also, um, but shifts, uh, it would be my recommended way of doing that. Uh, it, makes the, it makes it much easier and it eliminates some issues. Um, so within the shifts, uh, we have the ability now to uh, suspend and resume them. Um, so should a, a cashier be using a, 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 a drawer, a terminal, uh, and maybe they're going to go on their break, they can, res they can suspend that shift, and then someone else can come in and start their shift. When the person comes back from their break, they can resume. Uh, blind close is kind of an industry term, um, if you're not familiar with it. Really, the idea there is, um, uh, so there's, there's, it can be used in a few different ways. But the basic idea is that you don't want to be counting your drawer at the terminal. Um, so it could be because someone else needs to use that terminal. Maybe you've only got one point of sale terminal um, in the front of the store. And so you want somebody else to be able to use that. And so you want to basically close out this batch. You're going to set or shift. I apologize. Uh, you're going to close out this shift, and you want to start up a new one. But I don't have time to do my tender declaration right now. Um, so maybe you're going to do that at the end of the night instead. Or maybe you just need to take that into the back room, where you've got a secure door, and there's not customers out on the sales floor um, watching you stack up all your money on the, on the counter to count it. Uh, so that's what the blind close functionality is about. Closing the shift is really just that. It's, it's, you're saying, I'm done with all of this. I've done all of the different drawer activity throughout the day, and now I'm done with this shift, um, and so it needs to be reconciled. And then finally, print X and print Z. If you've been around in retail, um, these, these have been around for forever, basically, um, back to the ECR days um, and, and probably before. Um, but these are your shift reports. Uh, so an X report can be done any time throughout the day, and it gives you a quick little uh, summary report of what's happened during that shift. And then the Z report is done once at the end of the day. And it's pretty much that same information, but that would be considered the final shift report um, for that particular shift. So there's, uh, there's some end of day setup um, that's configurable. Um, and like many aspects of the solution, is very configurable. So uh, we certainly can't go through all of the different ways that this can be set up, but we'll touch on some of the key points. Um, so a lot of this is configured through each individual payment method. So obviously, at the end of the day, the way that you treat cash is going to be different than the way that you treat checks is going to be different than the way that you treat credit or debit or, or whatnot. So that's all configured at the, at the payment level. Um, certain aspects are, are set up at the store as well. Um, and maybe there's even probably a couple configuration options that impact it uh, within the functionality profile. So we'll switch over into the solution now, and I'll show uh, some of this. There we go. So I mentioned that the, the most of this is going to be configured uh, at the payment, payment method level. 
and um, I think it's a point that's been made before, is that this is also then configured by store. So you can have your overall reference data. Uh, you'll basically only need to create cache once, um, but what cache means to a given store can be set up per store. So there's kind of an instance of that payment method for each store. Um, so I'll go to my Seattle store, and then I'll look at my payment methods. And I think we've seen this dialogue a few times throughout, but we'll talk about um, the, the aspects that would maybe uh, be interesting to shifts and end of day. Um, so you can see here that there's an operation ID. And uh, for cash sales, it's 200, which I think yep, is called pay cash. Uh, so what this is going to do is it's going to tell the point of sale client quite a bit. It's going to tell the point of sale client how to handle this, which dialogues need to be shown, uh, if the user needs to be prompted for something. Uh, and that's all determined by that, that operation ID. Uh, you can set whether or not a, a payment method should open the cash drawer. You would think um, within our demo data that cash should open the cash drawer. Um, so in, in real life, you would probably have that checked. Uh, whereas for maybe checks, you wouldn't have that option enabled because cash drawers often have a little slot that you can just stick the check in and it goes underneath the till. Um, if we look at um, the posting aspect, you'll see that you can configure um, uh, different accounts uh, for each payment method. And again, remember, this is also per store. I think our demo data has all of them going into the same accounts, uh, which is a nice, simple implementation. But that can certainly be customized based on what the retailer is looking for. Um, the tender declaration options are important. Um, and, and the one that, uh, that I'm uh, going to talk about first is around counting required. Uh, so cash, obviously, is going to be counted. Um, you can set this for any of the payment methods, but often things like, say, uh, debit card transactions, there isn't anything, there isn't an artifact left over in the drawer for that. Uh, there's not a signature slip that you could even use to count for that. So obviously, you know, debit transactions you wouldn't. Uh, in most cases, you could even say that for credit cards as well, even, even checks. Depending on the retailer and the level of control they want over that, um, basically, do you want the person counting the drawer, reconciling the drawer, to enter that information, or should we just assume that everything's correct there? So you can set that up at a per payment method level. Um, taken to bank and taken to safe need to be enabled um, if you want this payment method to be able to um, be utilized for those two different operations. There's another setting uh, called tax, uh, cash declaration. And this is where you set up the different denominations that are available for whatever currency it is that you're using. And you can specify whether it's a coin or a note. Um, so this is, again, you consider it reference data. Um, and in most cases, it's going to be pretty standardized. But this could be configured um, if, just to meet kind of special needs. Uh, and this is also important if during your counting, so if I've, if I've enabled that this, this payment method needs to be counted at the end of the day, if you want them to be able to count by currency or if you just want them to enter a total amount. So I'm going to switch over into the, the point of sale now. And I'll log in as my cashier. So this is actually the first time I'm using this, this, uh, this terminal today. And the cashier is logging in for the first time. So they're prompted if they want to open a new shift or if they want to perform non-drawer operations. You've probably seen this dialogue through many of our demos uh, throughout the session, but I don't think anybody has actually explained it yet. This is new in AX2012, and this dialogue uh, controls a lot of uh, functionality around suspended shifts, resuming shifts, blind close, uh, floating till, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so basically what we're saying now is that there's no shift currently open on this terminal. No one has been ringing transactions in here yet. Um, and obviously, uh, you don't have one either. And when we talk about floating till, um, we'll, we'll be able to uh, go through that flow and see how this actually changes based on the, based on the state. So I'm just actually going to say that I'm going to open my shift. And now I would, the first thing I would do is I would, I would uh, enter my opening amounts. Now, depending on the retailer, this is all going to change. Um, sometimes the cashiers have all of that control, all of that responsibility on their own. And sometimes that's a good thing, because it's like they're the ones that are accountable for it. Other times, it's the shift supervisor that does it, or it's the, the manager or assistant manager. So we know that that's all can be controlled through our roles and privileges, and it can all be controlled through our screen layouts. 
our demo data actually assumes that it's going to be the manager doing this. But for demo purposes here, I've actually added the drawer operations button to our, to our, uh, our, our salesperson's screen layout. So I'm actually just going to choose to declare my start amount. And we'll say it's $100. So now the system, oh, let me, let me uh, explain this. So there's a couple documents I want to show you throughout the way. Uh, throughout, the, throughout the demo. Um, in most cases, I'm actually just going to cancel this. But what I've done is I've set up in my hardware profile for my, my printer to be the, the XPS document writer. Um, so in that case, I can pull up on the screen uh, whatever document would be printing out of the point of sale. So in reality, this would actually be going to a printer, and uh, it would print a little stub that I've done my, my, I've entered in my opening amounts. So now I'm ready to sell. So this, the, the system knows that I've, I've started with $100. You can actually do this um, any time throughout the day. So it's, it's, uh, it's not even that, that uncommon that, um, that the person starts their shift and there's already a customer waiting at the, at the line. You can process that customer and then enter your starting amounts. And we still know that what the original starting amount was. You would just have to, um, you'd have to know how much you just took in. Um, you'd want to know what that original starting amount is. But the operation can be performed at any time. So I'm just going to go ahead and ring up a sale. You've definitely seen this before. Uh, so now maybe I, it's, some time passes. I need to add additional money into, this, into the system. I can go back into my uh, drawer operations and do a float entry. So here I'm going to add maybe another $50 into my drawer. So now, in reality, my starting amount is, is more like $150. Um, should I need to give someone money or take money out of this drawer, maybe to go into a different one, I can do a tender removal. And then I can also show just, I mean, these all pretty much look the same. But just so that we have a variety here, I'm going to do a safe drop. So this one's a bit different in that it's set up um, that I can be able to uh, use those denominations to count. Um, and what this is doing is it's actually showing all of the different currencies that are configured within the system, um, which uh, it can be a bit much <laughs> as all the different uh, currencies that are in the reference data within AX. Um, ideally, we would have a setting that, would, that you could specify of which currencies you want to show within the store. And, and that's something that we don't do today. So it's going to show all of the currencies. Um, but that's, that's an improvement we should make in the future. Um, and so I can either just enter the amount I want to put into the safe. Uh, we'll just say $50. And I could do that for multiple currencies. Or I can use the counting. So here's the denominations that I defined. So I can say how many pennies, how many quarters, how many fives. And it'll do the math for you. OK, so now that I've had some drawer activity, um, I can look at, say, what my X report might look like. So this I will want to print. And in this case, the cashier doesn't have the rights to run an X report. So I'm going to do some temporary uh, elevation of privileges and have the manager provide their credentials. And I'll save this one. We can look at that X report. So this is going to give you kind of that summary information. Or, or actually, I mean, to some degree, it's pretty detailed. It's all going to be summarized. So if I had done multiple bank drops or multiple safe drops, it's going to be the total amount there. But as you look down, you can see you know, how many sales I've done, how many returns, how much I've collected in taxes. Um, you can see that in amounts as well as counts. So how many sales have you processed? So you can see to a store manager why this would be very valuable information. Um, and then at the bottom, the tender totals is basically what's expected um, from this shift from a, from a dollar amount. And because I haven't done a tender declaration, um, my, my counted amount is zero so far. So the system thinks I'm $131.95 short. So you probably would not be allowed to go home if that was the case. Um, so I'll declare my, uh, my tender declaration. Does anybody remember that amount? <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. 
131.90 something. Good enough? OK, so there I've, I've counted in my amount. And now the drawer knows, or the, the system knows how much I believe is in the drawer. So it knows what it should be in the drawer. And it knows what I believe to be in the drawer. And by, me, by that, I mean I actually counted the money. And that's what, I, what I'm telling the system is what is in that drawer. Now I can close my batch, or shift, pardon me. Close my shift. And closing shift will actually also print the Z report. Um, which looks just like the X report, only you're, it, again, it's, it's, config, it's considered to be the final report for that shift. Um, so it will close the shift, it'll mark it as closed, and then it will print the Z report. The print Z report option here will just reprint the last Z report. So should you need to get another copy of it, that's what that operation does. I'm going to go back into AX now, and I'm going to pull up that information. If we look in the inquiries under transactions, in reality, this dialog could use some better sorting options. Um, and I did run some transactions this morning to make sure most of this stuff works. So you're going to see more on 324 than we just did. Um, but we'll just take a quick little look here, and you can trust me that, that this is working. Uh, but you can see here's the sales transaction that I'd done. If we come back and look at the types, um, you can see that more is considered a transaction than simply a sale. So when the user logs on, that's considered a transaction. Uh, when I entered my starting amount, that's a transaction. My float entry, my tender removal, my safe drop. You, you can just see quickly from that list um, that it's not just a sale that's considered a transaction. And this is all the information that those P jobs pull up and put into the retail tables that are within AX. I had closed my batch, or <laughs> shift. Uh, so now I can actually look at that as well. Um, so uh, let's see. I'll, I should have two from today, or three, actually. Um, we can look at the times here. Uh, it looks like the, the bottom one. Yeah, actually, and that one hasn't been, that hasn't been uh, posted yet. So this is the shift that I had, uh, I had actually created it. I had done some transactions on and then closed the shift. So now this information is available within AX also. And from here, I can go in and look at details. And it's a lot of that same kind of statistical information that you would see from that Z report. But you can view that here from within AX. In fact, I think you can even reprint the Z report here from within AX also. And through inquiries, you can drill down on some of those detailed information. So any of the tender transactions that were part of this shift, you can view those. Um, any account transactions you can view. Uh, this actually ideally should be a list of transactions only from this shift. Um, but I would kind of call that as a known issue, where it actually just shows you that, tr that entire um, uh, transactions list again. It's not filtering it based on this shift. Um, but I, as I, I'll show you here, it just brings up that same dialogue that we had before. Uh, and it's, well, actually, this appears to be only within the shift. When I, tr uh, when I was doing it earlier, it, it was showing transactions from other shifts as well. So that was a very um, kind of linear flow of how that would work. And it was very simple. And actually, all of that functionality is in AX 2009. Um, so now I'm going to show you um, some more, uh, more scenarios or more flows that can happen. Uh, and all of this is actually enabled by the fact that we now have that store database that Rubens talked about. In AX 2009, the recommended deployment was that each terminal had its own database. And so therefore, there was really no talking between the terminals. They could be sitting right next to each other, and they'd have no idea how to access each other's information. Uh, so now that there's a centralized uh, store database that all of the terminals read and write from, now that data can be shared from terminal to terminal. So I had closed my shift. When you close your shift, it also logs you out, because we assume that you're done. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and create another shift. So that's what we had just done before. Now I'm going to skip some of those other steps, because they're, they're really not uh, all that interesting anymore. So let's pretend I've been doing some transactions throughout the day. Um, and now I want to take my break um, or, or, um, and let someone else use the system. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to suspend my shift.
So again, so I'm at terminal one, and I've suspended my shift. So I can just leave my drawer in there, the till, kind of the insert with the money in it, if I know no one else is going to be using that. Or I can actually take that out and go put it in the back room into the safe, which you'll see is very, very common in grocery. Um, let's say I left the till in there, and I went on my break, and the manager's going to cover for me. So the manager can log in on terminal one, and they get some additional options. So the manager is obviously a different user than the one that was there before. So maybe I, I want to open my own shift, um, and I'll have my own accountability. Um, or I'm just another cashier that's coming in that's going to take over for the one that was, has been suspended. So then I can open another shift. So each terminal can actually have multiple shifts on it, but only one active shift at a time. So if I go ahead and open another shift right now, say shift number two, I can do all those drawer operations and hopefully process some sales. And then I can suspend that shift. The person can come back from their break, and then they can resume their shift. And then they can go you know, stock the shelves or sweep the floor and suspend their shift. And I can come back in and resume my shift again. So you're going to have multiple shifts on the same terminal, only one active shift at a time. And that's controlled by either suspending or resuming your shifts. But because I'm a manager, um, I can actually use someone else's shift if I want to. And those are configuration options that are stored within those POS um, privilege, uh, permissions, uh, whether it's from the group or um, specified per user. So I'm actually just going to resume an existing shift. So this would show you all of the shifts that are currently assigned to this terminal. Um, and uh, in this case, I only have that one. And I'm going to choose to resume this one. So now this is the original employee's shift. I can use this just as though I was that employee. All of the transactions I ring up will be tagged with my information, so I'll know which transactions were done by who, but there's still just one cash drawer accountability. So there'll still just be one tender declaration and one closing of that shift. You're just letting me use your shift. And some retailers are fine with that, and that's their kind of, that's their normal operation. And others, that's the, you know, they make sure that everyone has their own, their own shifts. It really depends on the retailers. So I can come back from my break now. My shift was still active, so the manager didn't suspend my shift, so I don't get prompted to resume anything. So I can just log in here, and because it's my shift, there's really nothing to worry about. I can then continue to sell. So then let's say it's time for me to go home, um, but we, you know, we don't want to count the, the money right here. So I can actually go in, and I can blind close my shift. So that puts the shift into a status of, you know, you can't bring any more sales into here, but we're not quite done with it yet because nobody's done the tender declaration. So at, either at a later time, after the gates are closed and everyone's gone, the, cash, the manager can come in and do that tender declaration. Or uh, if you have a terminal in the back room, um, somewhere behind closed doors, you can go and resume that shift there um, to, do, to do the tender declaration. And that could be either by the manager or the cashier. Again, it's all controlled by privileges. So let's pretend I'm in the back room now. Um, so here I'm going to choose actually to do a non-drawer operation, which seems a bit contradictory since I'm going to be counting a drawer. Um, but what that means is I want to use the point of sale system without creating a new shift is really what that option means. And um, there's some improvements that we can do here because there's a lot of operations in the point of sale that you actually technically don't need a shift for, but we're blocking you. So that's something that we, we, we want to improve. Uh, but there was some, um, some complex kind of wiring in, in place there that we just kind of did this for um, either for the things that were, were ultra low cost or for the things that we thought were really, really important. Like we don't want you to have to create a new shift because you want to close someone else's shift. So I can perform a non-drawer operation to do that. But you'll see that you can do things like price lookups and inventory lookups without having to create a new shift. But as Ruben was showing you when he was trying to do stock count, it was telling him he needed a shift for that. So in reality, you shouldn't have to have a shift to do a stock count. And those are improvements that we'll continue to make in the future. Um, for now, I'm going to choose to do a non-drawer operation. And then as the manager, I can come in and I can view all of the blind closed shifts, which would be the one that I had here. Down at the bottom, you can see all the things that I can do with this. Um, so I can re-enter the starting amounts if those were forgotten or if those were incorrect. Uh, I can do my tender declaration, which is probably going to be the most common. I can print that X report. Um, basically, all those operations that we had done within that first flow can now be done 
by a different user and on a different terminal. Since the, actually there's no transactions within this at all, um, I'm just going to go ahead and close that shift. Again, we'll switch into AX and we'll upload these transactions. Oops, not that one. Shifts. So now I should have some additional ones here. In fact, if I look at this last one, um, there, I logged on three times, but I really didn't do anything else uh, with, any, with any money or anything like that. With that, we'll move on to the next topic. Which is statement posting. So all of that happened at the store, and it happens throughout the day, and it's happening at all the terminals throughout all the stores. So you can imagine how this scales out. It's not just some guy at a laptop on a podium. Um, and so this is all happening throughout the day. The transactions are uploading. Um, the recommended way to do this is to upload frequently throughout the day rather than waiting till the end of the day to upload all this information from all of these terminals. And all of this information is going into these, um, these kind of staging tables within AX that has all that detailed uh, transactional information. And that was that transactions inquiry that we had seen before. Um, so next, we need to actually do something with that data in AX. Really, nothing has happened yet other than we've moved some data. AX doesn't know, AX, you know, kind of core AX, whether it's from a financial perspective or from an inventory perspective, doesn't know anything about what's happened so far. Uh, so that's when uh, we start talking about statements. And statement is really, in a sense, it's almost like a shift, where we said it's kind of a collection of transactions that happen. Um, only a shift is kind of done at a higher level. Um, and, it's, and it's done uh, within the back office. You can think of this as kind of the retail financial document um, that, that occurs within AX. Um, and I mentioned before that shifts can be done, um, or, I, I apologize, statements can be done uh, either with a start date and an end date, or starting time and end time, uh, or they can be done based on shift. So I wanna, I wanna um, create a statement for all of the, sh the closed shifts. Uh, that haven't been on a statement before. Or you can say, I want to create a statement for all of the transactions that have happened between this time and that time. Um, so we'll, we'll get to some more of this in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the demo. But a very, very key point here is that when you post a statement, um, and, I'll, and I'll go through a, a slide that actually shows this process, but when you post them, we create sales orders within AX. So the sales transactions, the cash and carry transactions that occur within the point of sale system uh, are uploaded. And then you create statements to post those into the financials within AX. And when we do that, our posting process creates a sales order. And the reason we do that, is, and, and really the, the top one is, is probably the most important reason for this, is to ensure GLS regulatory compliance. Um, so there's teams of people within AX to make sure that um, from a financial perspective that they're meeting all the regulatory requirements uh, get given for all the locales that AX uh, supports. And should we try to circumvent that, maybe for performance reasons or for simpl simplicity, then we're opening ourselves up to, to being, uh, not being compliant within a given region. But if we just populate sales orders and let AX post those, then we know that that's all going to be taken care of. So that was a big change that was made uh, back in AX 2009, rather than going directly to those journals. Uh, the other thing that we like about it is it gives you one consistent place uh, for referencing and looking up and tracking sales. All of your sales are coming in through sales orders, whether it's a sales order that was created online, whether it was a sales order that was created in AX client, or whether it was a sales order that was created as a result of transactions within the point of sale. Uh, and this slide is kind of uh, um, a good way to set this up to, to understand this conceptually. Uh, so at the very bottom of the box, um, sales happen. Uh, transactions happen at the point of sale. Uh, and those are pulled from the point of sale using those P jobs periodically throughout the day, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, depending on the retailer, uh, into the staging tables, which is the second green box above that. And that's where we've, we store all of these transactions that come up from, uh, from the point of sale. So this is actually a very key point here, and I'll come back to this again later. Um, but the, if you think about the cycles, uh, you want to be pulling up information up as, as often as possible. 
Um, but then there's, there's basically three things that need to happen in the end when you're all done. Is that you need to make financial uh, postings, you need to have customer transactions, and you need to make, need to make inventory transactions. But if you think of kind of the, the retailer's needs, um, the, that, that cycle isn't exactly the same. So you want inventory transactions to be as up to date as, as often as possible. Whereas the financial transactions, typically, it's, it's really not that important. Now, I say that it could be for some retailers more than others, but I would say the typical process would be that you would want your inventory to be updated as real time as possible. I don't think anybody would argue that point. But from a financial perspective, that can usually happen at the end of the day. Um, so that can all be, um, all be done uh, to suit the retailer's needs. So we have, let me actually go back and just talk about the, the top bullet point there, is we have a batch process that can run that will simply reserve the, transaction, the, the inventory quantities from the transactions that have been updated throughout the day. So remember, AX is the master of the inventory, it's the master of the quantities. Point of sale is simply bringing in transactions that say increment one or decrement one or whatever. So that comes up from the point of sale, it goes into the, the transaction tables, AX knows nothing about that until something else happens, and that's kind of our inventory reservation job that will keep your inventory in sync without having to do the financials just yet. And those two things can be done separately. So there's a, a, a batch uh, framework job that I'll show you that will do that. And so if this job is also running regularly, say every five, ten minutes, like the P jobs coming up, then your on-hand quantities are going to be kept very current. Then finally, when you're actually ready to actually calculate and post these statements, um, is when we go ahead and we create um, the financial, the customer transactions. And then if you didn't do the inventory jobs, then obviously we'll do those then as well. If you did, then it takes those reserved quantities and then it finally posts them. So it takes them on to the next step. So the inventory batch job simply reserves the quantities. And then when the rest of the transactional information comes in and we post them, then those, 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 trend, uh, those quantities become finalized. So this is actually just a screenshot of those POS transactions that come, came up. And we've already talked about this, so we'll go through this. Um, and then there's obviously, like anything else throughout the system, there's a bunch of parameters um, that dictate how this is going to work. And we'll talk about these more when we get into the, uh, into the demo portion. And then finally, um, you can set up some of these options um, per store. And, and, and actually, um, because when posting occurs, it goes into accounts, there's a few other places that you can set up the accounts also, um, like per payment method. So per payment method, you can have different accounts. Um, we talked about how the income and expense can go to different accounts. So some of that we've touched upon before, and some of it isn't necessarily key to this topic. But um, know, to, know that um, anything that's going to be posted needs to have accounts associated to it. For the most part, that's all done um, from within the store or from within the payment methods. Um, on the warehouse uh, that's assigned to a store um, are, is some really important information. It's, it's down towards the bottom and probably hard to see, um, but there's two new options that we've added in, in uh, 2012, which is, has to do with negative inventory, and someone had a question about that earlier today. Um, so it's very common um, for many very, very, very valid reasons that inventory is going to be considered negative. So it could be that you've it's out on the sales floor, and you're selling it, and someone just simply hasn't counted it in yet. Um, it could be that your quantities are off. So we know very often that the system can think you have one thing, and you actually have another thing. Um, and that's why they do physical inventories and cycle counts. Um, so there's many, many valid reasons, whether it's due to a delay in processes, or it's due to just the you know, physical happenstance of shrinkage and, and uh, clerical errors. So, this, it's very important for retail to be able to allow quantities to go negative. And this has always been possible um, from a per item perspective. Um, but, uh, and, and in actually in AX 2009, we had a kind of a workaround where when we were posting our statements, we would just, we would force it to go through. Um, which in the end kind of got the same results, but what we realized is not a good thing, is that the rest of AX didn't know anything about that. Um, and so that could be, uh, that could put you in a, in a bad situation, or at the very least it can, it can prevent you from being able to do what you need to do because your, your quantities are negative. Um, so here we have it at the warehouse level, and you can set it for financial or um, inventory and whether or not you allow it to go negative. In my mind, most retailers are going to have these options checked. 
the very bottom two drop-down lists there. Um, I, I can't remember if I talked about them in a previous session or if that was in the sales track. Um, but these are default storage dimensions that the POS client isn't aware of. So we, we talked about how the point of sale client is aware of product dimensions, size, color, style, configuration, some tracking dimensions like serial numbers, um, but storage dimensions like um, default loca or location and pallet ID, point of sale client doesn't know about that at all. However, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to sell those things at the point of sale. So when we post, if we don't have this information, then posting will fail. And we don't want that to happen. So this is where you can set a default. So if the transaction came up from point of sale and the product is configured to require this information, then we'll provide this default information and posting can continue. Um, this is uh, where I talked about statements can be done manually or automatic or uh, um, uh, through batch framework um, uh, periodically. So on the left-hand side, not much to show there than some menu options, but you can see the three different types. So post inventory is that inventory reservation batch process that I talked about, and that's the one that you want running as often as possible, um, keeping those inventory quantities um, as close to real time as possible. Um, and then the next two are really just um, the next phases within uh, statement, creating statements and, and finally posting them. And so these are broken out individual because, again, retailers are all going to have their own processes and their own expectations here. So you can have the system automatically calculate the statements for you. So it will go through periodically, whether that's every few hours or at the end of the night or however you want that to be. And it will create and calculate the statements, but then stop there. And that gives the user the ability to go in and view them and modify them before they finally post them. Um, or you can actually have, you can configure the third job as well, where it'll actually go and automatically post any of the calculated statements. So this can be really hands off if you want it to be. Everything can just kind of keep churning in the background. And then obviously the, the, the other end of the extreme is where everything's manual, where the user goes in and creates the statement, calculates the statement, and then posts the statement. Once a statement's posted, um, there's an inquiry that shows all of the posted statements. And the important thing here is that this is kind of your, um, your reference if you've kind of followed the path from, from the posted statement into all of the, the, um, all the documents that get created, all the different artifacts. Uh, so we're creating journal entries, we're creating vouchers, um, all into the kind of the deep, dark uh, depths of AX financials can all be referenced back. And you can get all the way back um, in either direction from the original sales transaction that came up from the point of sale down into the vouchers that occurred as a result of the statement calculation and statement posting. So with that, I'm going to show that in a bit of a demo. My screensavers come on. There we go. Okay, so we've already made some sales, so that's good. Uh, we've uploaded them. That's good. And we've already looked at kind of the list of transactions to prove that they, they came up. So I can kind of skip those over for now. Uh, let's go in and look at the parameters that can impact posting. That's under uh, retail parameters and then posting. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is um, periodic discounts. So Joseph did a great session about the different kind of discounts we have in the point of sale. And so this is going to determine what uh, the statement posting process does with that discount information. Um, so you can choose not to post periodic discounts, and then it'll go basically just into um, uh, the, the standard accounts um, uh, that you would, uh, as, you, as you create and post sales orders, as if it was just done through AX. If you choose to post the periodic discounts, then you can specify how you want those to be posted. Um, so you can choose whether it's going to go into the standard discount account, or if you want to specify um, periodic discounts accounts for each ones. Each each of them. <laughs> um, so Joseph talked about there's a discount, there's quantity discount, there's mix and match. You can post each of these into different GL accounts if you want. Or if you go back and choose standard, then they can all just go into the standard discount account. Um, the next is around inventory update. Uh, so we do different, uh, there's different types of aggregation that's done at different points. And this is to update or to aggregate the inventory transactions that occur during that inventory reservation job. So if I set this to details, then every single transaction that comes up is going to result in a, 
uh, inventory reservation, uh, a, 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 tr a single transaction uh, resulting in an inventory reservation. If I do this as summary, then each time we run that job, first we add them all up together and then make that reservation. So do you want 10 individual reservations or do you want one reservation of 10 is, is basically what it would do. And so we, we would aggregate that based on, um, uh, on kind of all of the, the, uh, the unique um, ways to classify something. So per item, um, then you have to consider all the different uh, dimensions that there are so, so that you're reserving the, the correct you know, small green uh, long sleeve t-shirt. Um, so, there, so when you choose summary, it's going to uh, add them all together or aggregate them uh, based, on the, uh, based on the type of product that it is. Um, automatic settlement. So again, we, if, we, if we think of the fact that we're going to take all this detailed uh, retail transactional information and then post it into financials, uh, we, but we do that by creating sales orders and then invoicing those sales orders with all of the payment journals associated to that, do you also then want to automatically settle those, um, those invoices? And in most cases, I would say yes, that this option would be checked. The next level of aggregation has to do with those sales orders. So, so around uh, inventory update, that detail level is, the amount of, is, the, is whether you're, or not you're aggre aggregating or summarizing the inventory transactions to be reserved. Um, the next one's here around um, when we're posting the statements. And safe drop, bank drop is pretty straightforward, pretty simple, and probably it's not like you're going to have thousands and thousands of these transactions anyway, but you can, you can consolidate these as well so that there's fewer journal entries in the end. Um, but the voucher transactions one is probably the most important one that we can talk about on this whole page, and that's whether or not you're going to summarize all of the information that came up from the retail transactions into, um, into um, fewer, I don't want to say one, but fewer sales orders or leave them out as, additional, as uh, individual sales orders. So if I uncheck this option, every single cash and carry transaction that occurs at the point of sale will result in a one-to-one -one relationship of sales orders that go into AX. Um, so again, if that's what you want, then that's a great thing. If not, then you can summarize them, in which case we do lots of aggregation there too. Um, so we will aggregate, say, um, um, uh, all of the walk-in customer transactions um, into, into, say, a single sales order, and then the line items that are on that will be aggregated, and then the payment methods that have been collected will be aggregated. So it'll be one, one sales order, or it, it can result in multiple, but just for simplicity's sake, it'll be a single sales order that'll have a whole lot of line items on it, um, but with all of those quantities added up. And then obviously each time you've paid cash throughout the day, that will be one payment of this lump sum of cash. Uh, so that can result in much, much better performance. It can result in much less data that's hitting your, your accounts and in, in, uh, in documents within AX. Uh, so this is an extremely important configuration option here. One other thing to point out is that um, if it's a named customer transaction, so, um, so when, uh, when Tony Poe comes into the store and identifies herself as Tony Poe and I sell something to her, that will still result in a single sales order. So, um, so, so a, a named tr customer transaction uh, will be one-to-one -one, um, when, you're, when you're posting and creating those sales orders. Um, just very quickly here. Oops. Didn't mean to do that. Pardon me. Uh, we can look at the store settings. around the statement and closing section here. Um, so statement method is, um, so we, we talk about a statement as being kind of an, a, a collection of transactions over a period. That could be over a period of time or a, peri a, a, a collection of shifts, if you do them time-based or shift-based. Um, and then you can summarize within there um, so that you can group that information. Uh, actually, let me go into edit mode so I can show you what those options are. Um, so you can group that information by terminal by staff or just in a total. So if you think about, um, you're going to create, in, in most cases, maybe one statement per day per store, but this store has 10 terminals. So then in that case, maybe I want to group this by terminal, and I can view all of that information um, by terminal. 
Uh, or maybe you only have a few terminals, but you've got lots of employees. So, and maybe in this case, it makes more sense for you to look at this information by staff. And all it is is while you're viewing that, that, um, that statement, how you want to see that information. Um, it doesn't impact the actual posting of that statement or how those sales orders are, are created. This is just within the summary of that statement. And when I actually show you the statement, this will make a whole lot more sense. Um, and then how that, um, the, the calculation occurs, I've talked before, where you can do that by shift or you can do that by date time. This is the default setting here. If you're manually creating statements, you can actually choose to do, you can choose either way, anytime you want, at the time that you're creating the statement. Um, but if you're going to um, uh, do it through the batch process, um, or, or if you're just setting the default, then this is where you can set that up to be either by shift or by date time. So now I'm actually going to uh, create a statement so you can see what it looks like. And I'm going to look at my, um, my list of open statements. Right now there aren't any in here. So I'll manually create a new statement. And I mentioned before that statements are per store, so they'll always be per store. And I'm going to create one now for my Seattle store where I've been doing all of this. Um, so the first step that you're going to do is you actually, if you go in, you'll see that there's nothing in it. There's no lines. There's nothing to, there's nothing to happen here. Um, so then you click Calculate Statement. Um, if I go in and look at the setup, it's going to tell me how it's going to calculate that. So this is kind of that summary method that came from the store setting, that I'm going to group this information by terminal. Um, uh, and then uh, this is the closing method. So this is going to say that I want to I create a statement that's going to include all of the transactions um, for all the closed shifts that haven't been posted yet. Uh, if I chose to um, select this as date time, then I can specify the start date and end date here, and it's going to get all of the transactions that haven't been posted from this time to that time. The danger of this, when I was talking about this before, when, uh, when I said that uh, I believe that shift is the better way to do this, um, the danger here is that if you choose a date and time that doesn't actually encompass uh, what occurred during that, that shift. So you know, I came in and put in my opening amounts um, you know, at 9 o'clock, and then you know, I didn't put in my tender declaration until 9.15, but you thought maybe I had done it at 9 p.m. So it's not going to get that tender declaration. So when you create that statement, it's actually going to look like you're short. So, so when you do your by time, you have to make sure that you actually have all of those transactions that you want. When you do it by shift, we put those markers there. And so therefore, it's only going to take the whole set of information. You'll have the starting amounts. You'll have the, the drops, the, sa the safe drops, the bank drops, the sales transactions, and then that very, very important tender declaration that happens there. So it, date time can, can certainly work for certain retailers. But in my opinion, by shift is, is, is the right way to go. So I'm going to leave that as the default. And now I'll calculate the statement. So this is going and it's finding any of those transactions for this store that haven't been posted yet, or actually that aren't on a statement yet. Um, so I could create this statement and then just close it. I've created it and calculated it and closed it. More transactions could come in, and I could go create another statement and calculate it. And then it'll pull those next group of transactions, as long as the shift is closed, into the next statement. And this is actually what that um, calculate statement um, batch job will do. It'll create a whole bunch of open calculated statements for you. Um, and it makes sure that there's obviously there's no duplicate transactions that occur on more than one statement. Um, but in this very simple um, uh, demonstration, we'll just create one. And you can see that it's, um, it's showing it by terminal, um, which is what my, my, uh, my method was here. I could have done this by staff or just as a total. Um, and then for each of the payment methods that come in, uh, what the transaction amount was, how much has been banked or safe dropped, and then the counted amounts in here, and then whatever my delta is. So I think you know, people yelled out that it was 131.95, but I counted 131.90, which could be the case because people make mistakes giving change back all the time. And so therefore, I've got a difference of five cents, which is just fine. So the system has ways to set up what those thresholds are. Um, so maybe you know, anything up to $2 over a short is OK. If you go beyond that, then, then there's going to be some kind, of, uh, uh, some kind of action required for somebody to reconcile that. Um, I believe the demo data is set up to, to be forgiving on a nickel. Um, should that not be the case, then statements can actually be edited as well. So not the, inf not the information that came up, but what that counted amount is. 
So if someone should go back and recount that information and find that someone had made a mistake after it's been uploaded to AX and after that batch has been closed, at, or shift has been closed at point of sale, there's no way to edit it there. But someone in the back office could do that. So if I wanted to actually correct this and make this 131.95, then I can do that. And now I don't have a difference. And then I can post this statement. So now what it's doing is it's, and there's not a lot going on here. I think I'd only done maybe one transaction. But it's going to try to uh, aggregate these things. So any of the walk-in customers, it's going to create a sales order for, um, for, all, for any transactions that occurred for that walk-in customer. Um, and then it'll aggregate, obviously, any of the items that are on it and any of the payments that are on it. So now it's said that I've created one voucher. My list of open statements is empty now. And now I can go look at my list of posted statements. And I believe this is probably the one here. Yep. So now from the posted statement, I can still see those same uh, lines down here. Basically moves it uh, into a different state. Uh, but the important thing here is now that you can drill down and find out what this has actually done. So if I go into the inquiries, um, you can view the list of transactions that were actually uh, included here. And this is, again, it goes into the, those uh, retail transaction tables. So you can get into the details. Um, any of the shifts that occurred. Um, so this is similar to what we'd seen before. Um, but this is actually very important. These are the invoices that it created. So here I only had one sale and I'm doing aggregation. So it's not very surprising that I have a single invoice that was created. If I wasn't doing aggregation and I had rung up 100 sales, can anyone guess how many invoices I would have? 100, right? So that's how that's going to work. Um, so depending on your aggregation and depending on the amount of um, uh, transaction volume that occurs, uh, you're going to uh, create a certain number of invoices here. You can see the vouchers that were uh, created as a result of those. And then you can view the payment journals that are corresponding. So this is the payment journal record that was created and any payment lines here. So in this case, uh, you know, I, I did exact change for 31.95 of cash. I switch over. Um, so that was me manually doing that. So just a quick recap. Uh, transactions happen throughout the day at the point of sale. They come up into AX, but nothing happens unless I either create and calculate and post statements, or at the very least, do that inventory reservation job. And this is where those are, are set up here. Um, if you go under periodic into POS posting, if I want to keep my inventory up to date, which I, I don't know how many retailers would not want to keep their inventory up to date, then you can come in here and create a batch job for this and set that recurrence. And so now it's just the transactions come up from the P job and the quantities get reserved using the, um, the inventory reservation job here. If I wanted to take that a step further and automatically create those statements for me so I don't have to click new 800 times because I have 800 stores, then I can automatically create all of those statements and calculate them so that they're, they're, where, they're there waiting for me to, uh, to approve them and then finally post them. And if you're the very trusting person, then you can actually have it post them as well. So in this case is where those thresholds are very important. If there's a difference, say, more than $2, then I'm, I'm certainly not going to let this automatically post because there could be something going on there. Um, but certainly you can let this happen all unattended and then only have to deal with the exceptions if that's what you want. Um, so we've, we've gone basically um, you know, whole, uh, end to end from the transactions occurring at the point of sale and then posting into AX. Um, so one last thing to talk about from this perspective are the financial dimensions. Um, so financial dimensions have been around um, certainly from the AX 2009 release. Um, and we've always utilized them. Um, but as a core concept upgrade, basically, uh, um, there's the ability to now have custom dimensions and have as many dimensions as you want. And it's got a whole new framework for those dimensions. Uh, and so what we did is we added store and terminal as a dimension that can be added to any of the vouchers, any of the, uh, any of the transactional information going into AX um, as, uh, with the retail solution. So you can imagine wanting to know what your sales are per store or um, uh, what happened during this terminal. Um, so this is financial information that can get stamped on all of these transactions um, because they're coming in through the retail system.
So those you can see through General Ledger. Financial dimensions. And you can see that we've added now store and terminal. The rest of them, um, many, if not all, apply to retail just as much as these do. Um, but certainly stores and terminals are important to retailers. Um, so if I choose store, uh, and then you can view the values, you'll see that you'll actually see a dimension value for store for each of the stores that you have. And so now when a, a transaction comes through from a particular store, we'll add that dimension value in uh, based on the configuration. And then terminal is here as well. Um, you can set up your, um, your, uh, your, your account structures. <clears throat> so the demo data actually has some pretty decent um, account structures that, that utilize the retail information. Um, so if I look at P&L for retail, you can see the, the account structure that's here. It's looking for accounts. Um, basically within this range. Um, and then you can set up rules for these, um, which is going to determine exactly how these, um, these financial dimensions are used. Um, so for sales, we're going to uh, utilize the customer and then store terminal worker. So any sales transaction that gets posted uh, within those, that account range um, that was provided before um, is going to um, set up the, the dimension information from by adding customer, store, terminal, and worker information to it. And then just so you can see where you set up what those values are on those dimensions, um, you might have actually even seen it before, um, but just as a, as a recap, uh, if I go into retail and I look at my stores, I'll just open this one. Uh, you'll see that there's a uh, financial dimensions fast tab. And these are the dimensions that are, be that are in use. So customer group, um, department, item group, store, terminal, and worker. So it wouldn't make sense to put a terminal value on the store because there's multiple terminals within this store. So there, here, I'm just going to put the store value. And then I can certainly utilize customer group or department. So here I have a customer group of retail customers. Uh, that makes sense. Um, and then I have department of sales. So all of the transactions coming in through my retail channel are going to be considered as sales. Uh, this is all user definable. So this is just how it's set up within the sample data. Um, but it's pretty logical the way that it's set up. I don't know that it would be that far off. And then if you look at the terminals, oh, did I just close all of AX? Yes, I did. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I apologize. So what I really just wanted to show was that you would then set the individual terminal values at those terminals rather than setting them at the store. It's not all that interesting to see, but I can show you pretty quickly now that it's up. So the terminals are also going to have financial dimensions. And it looks like it's not set up for this particular terminal. But you would set that terminal information here um, on, the, on the terminal rather than at the store level. Let's check the Seattle ones. There you go. So this is the, this is the terminal number that corresponds um, to this particular terminal within the Seattle store. And then this, you can see the result of what you've done um, for the posted statements. So if we go back into the posted statements, um, and I go into my inquiries and say, look at my uh, statement journal, uh, my payment journal. you can see the, the, uh, the different dimensions were stamped into here. Um, so this is, um, yeah, actually, that works pretty well. Uh, so you can see the account um, that's coming from the, the payment method. Oops. Uh, the store is, is stamped into here. The terminal is stamped into here. The worker is stamped in here. So this is coming from all of those dimensions that you've got configured. Um, and as, it's, as, the statements, as the statements are calculated and posted, that information is, is collected, and it follows through all the way into those vouchers.